What's up everybody, I'm Jason and welcome back to another video in my series of tips and tricks for the Canon EOS R5. Unfortunately, this video isn't tackling something new, instead it's a major correction for what was tip 10, powering and charging the EOS R5 using the USB port. This revision comes thanks to some incorrect assumptions I made based on some poor manual writing by Canon. Given that, I have decided to replace that first video with this one. With that said, let's get to talking about powering the EOS R5 from the USB-C port. Now, I should note that much of this also applies to the EOS R and R6, however, the exact details may vary and I don't have either camera to test, so I won't be speaking to them directly. So one of the advantages of the R5 and its cousins over its DSLR predecessors is the ability to use USB power delivery, or USB PD, to charge and power the camera. To this end, Canon sells what is, in my opinion, a massively overpriced USB-C power adapter, the PDE-1. Now, admittedly, it has some nice aspects to it, having a detachable AC cord and a reasonably long USB cord. However, at $135 to $140 US, it's two to three times as expensive as a comparable wattage charger. I mean, Apple doesn't even put this kind of premium on their USB chargers. What's doubly frustrating to me is that instead of providing clear information regarding voltage, currents, or power requirements in the camera specification, Canon reverts to the good old Canon camera industry FUD implying that you can only use their charger to power your camera. The problem I have with all of this is that USB power delivery is an industry standard. Moreover, its devices and power supplies negotiate for the power and voltages they need. So it's not like the old school DC power supply system where a voltage is just put on the connector and if you use the wrong power supply, you risk blowing up your device. Under the hood, USB power delivery works something like this. When you connect a device to a USB PD power supply, the power supply brings up a connection with the device at the standard 5 volt USB levels. The power supply then checks the cable to see how much current it can carry and sends the device a list of power profiles that it can provide. The device then requests what it needs, and finally, the power supply verifies that the cable can support that much current and, if it can, switches everything over to the higher power profile. In short, USB PD is designed to be safe for your devices. Either the device and charger agree on the maximum voltage and current or power needed, or they don't, and the device doesn't draw any power from the source at all. Moreover, all of that negotiation is done at a safe level for any USB device, as all USB devices have to support 5 volt signaling. Higher voltages just aren't provided unless the device and charger agree. One thing that always confused me about USB PD was how much power a given power supply could supply at a given voltage. Under version 2 and 3 of the standard, which is what USB-C ports use, chargers can supply 5, 9, 15, and 20 volts, and, the varying, and at varying currents depending on the charger's power rating. When trying to match devices to chargers, I've always gone digging for the specs to see how many amps were available and at what voltages. However, in a move that actually surprised me given some of the other things they've did, done, the USB implementers form actually did something really intelligent in implementing power delivery on USB-C. The standard defines power rules, and these, are basic, and these basically describe what voltages and currents should be supported based on the charger's maximum wattage. Put simply, and as best I can tell without buying a copy of the actual standard, the power rules basically ensure that you can look at the wattage of the charger without having to worry about volts and amps. In the past, I would have said something like, you need to look at the output specs and make sure that they say, for example, three amps at nine volts. The only problem was most manufacturers didn't seem to want to publish that information on their websites, which of course made finding chargers problematic. However, with power rules, if you know the device needs three amps at nine volts, that's 27 watts, and so it's reasonable to assume that any 27 watt or higher charger should work. At this point, I should probably address the elephant in the intro. What changed from the previous version of this video? 
So put bluntly, I trusted the manual to be accurate. So I went on what the manual said and what I seemed to be observed in, in testing, which brings me to this. This is a Klein Tools ET920 USB digital voltmeter. I can plug this into a USB power supply and then plug my device into it, and it tells me the voltage that's being used, how much current is being drawn, and even how much power was consumed over the course of the measurement session. With this, I can see the actual voltages and currents that are being drawn, and as a, uh, as a result, whether the camera actually negotiated successfully with the charger or if it's not doing anything at all. It's one thing to think you know what's going on based on what the camera displays and the manual says. It's something entirely different when you can see what's actually going on over the wire. Okay, so let's talk about charging batteries with USB power. To start with, there are a couple of limitations. First, the camera will only charge LPE6N and LPE6NH batteries, not the original LPE6. Third-party batteries also probably won't work. I tried one third-party battery that I had, and the camera refused to charge it at all. Now, I should note, I don't use third-party batteries in my cameras for personal preference reasons. This battery was for a field monitor that I have that I didn't want to use my expensive Canon batteries in. The second limitation is that if you're using a BGR10 battery grip, the batteries are charged sequentially, not in parallel. Now, for charging itself, I had wrongly assumed that the R5 always used the 9-volt power profile, whether it was charging batteries or not. In my defense, it made sense to me that it would seem to be more efficient to step down 9 volts to 8.4 volt, uh, or to the 8.4 volt charging voltage that Canon uses, than it would be to step 5 volts up. In any event, it turns out that assumption isn't correct, which also may be related to those USB power rules again. Either way, battery charging uses the 5-volt profile, with my USB multimeter showing a current draw topping out at around 1.42 amps at 4.92 volts, for a total draw of, let's just round it to 7 watts. Interestingly, this is only slightly lower than the specified power levels for the LCE6 wall charger, so charging times should be in the same neighborhood. Accounting for efficiency losses at those rates, you should expect around two and a half hours or so to charge a fully discharged 16 watt hour LPE6 NH battery. And remember, with the battery grip, the camera charges one battery at a time, so plan on twice the time to recharge both batteries. While this kind of power is within the reaches of two and two and a half amp capable USB type A quick chargers, you can't use one. The R5 negotiates even this load with USB power delivery and it simply will not draw any power from a power supply that doesn't support PD. I tried, there's zero current draw when it's plugged into a two amp capable USB type A charger and that charger is more than happy to feed my iPad Pro with the same one and a half amps at five volts that I see the R5 drawing while it's charging. So in the previous incarnation of this video, I said you could use an Apple 15, uh, 18 watt Apple iPad Pro charger to charge the R5, and that was in fact and still remains true. The 18 watt, an 18 watt PD capable charger provides enough power to charge the batteries in the camera, but that's it. In fact, given that charging function uses 5 volts, which is limited to a maximum of 3 amps regardless, even a 15 watt charger or power bank should be capable of charging the camera. That said, I haven't tested any USB power delivery battery packs with the R5, so I can't say for sure what will and won't work. Now let's turn to actually powering the camera. This is the part that seriously tripped me up in the first incarnation of this video. Also, holy crap, can the R5 use a lot of power, or at least relatively speaking, which makes some of those thermal limitations entirely unsurprising to me now. The first requirement for powering the camera externally is that you must have a battery in the camera. Unlike using a dummy battery that simply supplies the right voltage to the camera, USB power delivery requires that the camera be able to power up and negotiate the right voltage and power profiles before it gets any power. 
However, once the USB PD link is established, just how much the camera continues to rely on that internal battery for anything other than moral support is not entirely clear. That said, you can't remove the internal battery while the camera is USB powered or the camera just shuts off. And Canon does suggest in the manual that the internal battery will be depleted to some extent while the camera is powered from the USB port and to use a fully charged battery for extended shooting sessions. That said, the camera will seamlessly transition from battery to USB power and back based on what's available. Operations such as recording video will not be impacted by disconnecting or connecting the USB power. So while you can't change the internal batteries, you can change the USB batteries or power supplies or simply remove the USB power completely without interrupting a recording session. Additionally, there aren't any restrictions on the type of battery that has to be in the camera while it's being powered. Even the venerable old LPE6, which can't be charged in the camera, can be used while the camera is USB powered. Powering the camera requires a USB power delivery capable charger that supports at least 27 watts and has a USB Type-C port. This means it has a 9 volt profile that's capable of supplying at least 3 amps. So that 18 watt Apple charger that I mentioned earlier and the one that I've been using to charge my R5 basically since I got it, has the juice to charge it but not the juice to power it. Part of my confusion over all this goes back to Canon's manual, which I'm increasingly finding is riddled with inaccuracies, poor explanations, and in some cases, just errors. On page 867 of the firmware 1.4 manual, it says, quote, to power the camera without charging the batteries, set the camera's power switch to on. The full battery icon is displayed on the LCD panel and the screen while the camera is powered. When I did my testing for the first version of this video, I saw the battery icon, a uh, full battery icon when the camera was plugged in, and given that's what the manual said I should see, well, I believe that it was working correctly. Of course, I also happened to have full batteries in the camera at the time too. In fact, that's not what you'll see when the camera is powered from the USB port. What you'll actually see depends on where you're looking. So if you're looking at the battery status on the rear screen or in the viewfinder, the blocks in the battery will, that indicate charge percentage will be gray when the camera is powered from the USB-C port and white when it's powered from the internal batteries. However, the battery icon will still indicate the current charge state as it normally would. Looking at the top LCD, what Canon calls the LCD panel, gives you no indication of what's going on at all. The battery status indicator doesn't change color or brightness, nor does it change to indicate a full charge. It simply shows the battery's charge state the same as it always does when the camera is running on battery power. Based on the manual, I very much expected that my camera was being powered over USB-C from the power source. I had it connected to, that 18 watt charger. And to be honest, there really should be a much better indicator than graying out the charge indicator blocks in the battery icon. Every display on the R5 supports arbitrary iconography. A plug, the letters PD or USB, a little USB connector, a lightning bolt, Anything that clearly indicated that the USB port was providing power would be vastly preferable from a user experience standpoint. Ultimately, this changes what I can recommend for powering the camera. Though for the most part, things should remain relatively straightforward. Basically, you need a charger that's capable of providing 27 watts or more. Specifically, you need three amps at nine volts if you're digging into the specs, but that should be covered by those power rules so that any charger that's 27 watts or higher should provide that. I'm currently using an Anchor PowerPort 3 65 watt two port charger, which I can confirm works properly for both charging and powering the camera. And this time based on actual current measurements and not just guessing based on what the manual says the camera kind of should display. I'll put a link in this, to the specific charger I'm using in the description below. As for battery banks, the same requirements should apply. USB type power delivery on the Type-C port and a minimum of 27 watts available for that port. 
Unfortunately, as with charging, I haven't tested any USB PD battery banks, so I'm going to refrain from, make, from making any suggestions here. To wrap this up, I want to briefly talk about power consumption. In the modern world of consumer electronics, especially with phones, tablets, and computers from companies like Apple and Samsung, it's not hard to believe that all devices should basically just sip power and do miracles. Canon certainly got blasted for the thermal limitations when recording 8K video, because certainly that wouldn't be a problem for any device to do while sipping power in the milliwatt range, right? Well, that's very much not the case. So I'm going to just throw out some basic numbers that I have based on some initial testing. Though I very much expect I'm going to do a much deeper dive into the R5's power consumption in some future videos uh, that I'm going to be working on. So just the basic case of sitting in the shooting standby mode using the rear screen with the screen brightness at four and the display performance set at power savings, so 30 frames per second, and IS enabled on the camera and lens, the camera consumes, or my camera consumed, around 500 milliamps at nine volts, or about four and a half watts. Now, bear in mind, this is the camera just sitting doing nothing. To put that in perspective, this is about two thirds the maximum power consumption of the A14 CPU in Apple's iPhone 12. Turning off the rear display using the Info 6 shooting screen drops power consumption by about 50 milliamps or 0.9 watts. Conversely, using the viewfinder in high performance mode, again, just sitting and shooting standby, draws around nine watts total. Recording 8K30 footage with IPB compression to an SD card with the rear screen and the power saving display performance drew between 10.8 and 11.7 watts. So that is approaching the two thirds mark of a 15 watt maximum power consumption of the CPUs used in Apple's iPad Pros. So there you go, charging and powering the EOS R5 from the USB port. It's nowhere near as simple as I had, or straightforward as I had expected. So if you found this useful, let me know by smashing that like button. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider subscribing if you aren't already. Remember, you can't forget to unsubscribe later if you don't subscribe now. Also, if you know somebody who might find this useful, spread the word and share it with them. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.